This is our first return to in-person Central Oregon Writers Guild meeting, January 11th, 2022, uh, figuring out the owl. I am sharing our landing page of our website, meetings and events. And I'm just gonna go through this really quickly here. We've listed everything that we've got coming for 2022. So today we're gonna do an editing panel with uh, Denise, Trish, Julie, and myself. Um, February, we've got Karina Castlebaum. We have Deborah Fresh, is that right? That oh, Freezy. Freezy, sorry. Um, we have a workshop with uh, Bob Balmer, Mining Your Life for Laughter. And that is, if you want to sign up for it, you can actually click that RSVP now. Um, in April, we have Bridget Lewis talking about dialogue. We have Jennifer Silva Redmond, how to pitch in May. June, we're going to talk to some agents. Uh, Julie Swearingen is going to do a workshop for us in, in June, um, social media workshop. Kristen Dorsey is going to talk to us about stories that we may have put away and how to revitalize those. We have a local author panel in August. We have um, Erica Berry is going to talk to us about reimagining research across genre. September writing workshop with Philip Kenny, who wrote a book called The Writer's Crucible. Uh, Catherine Melsinski, who's a fellow instructor at OSU, is going to talk to us about seeing around the narrator in October. November, we're going to get a presenter from the OSU MFA program, but we're not sure who yet. And also November workshop with Leva Moss uh, from published book to bestseller. And then, of course, in December, our member holiday reading. On the right side of this, these are events um, that we know of in Central Oregon, writing related events, workshops, and uh, readings, and so on and so forth. So there, you can just click on those and find out more about them. And that is the end of that share. So now I'm going to put the owl back on, and we're going to, uh, it is on, we're going to um, have Mary Krakow introduce our featured reader, and then we'll have them read. Thank you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm Mary Krakow. I'm the featured reader coordinator, and this is the start of the new year. And so I want to uh, extend an invitation to anyone who would like to read at the beginning of um, our monthly meetings. Please um, maybe put something in the chat, chat box or you can email me at marykrakow at gmail.com or you can contact Mike and he'll forward it on to me. If you're in the room this evening, there's a sign up sheet. Um, I think Mike may have printed off for me. There it is. Um, if you're interested, or if you think you might be interested in, <clears throat> please sign up and um, we'll, we'll get you all set up. Tonight's featured reader <clears throat> is a longtime Central Oregon Writers Guild member, Ginger Dellinger. And I'm gonna introduce her now. Okay. Ginger Dellinger is a native Oregonian who waited until she retired to begin writing in earnest. She writes in whatever genre seems to fit what she wants to write about and makes sure to devote part of her time to submitting her work. Her short stories and poetry have appeared in over a dozen journals and anthologies. She self-published her first novel, Brute Heart, a coming of age story set in Oregon and used a traditional publisher for Never Done, a family drama that takes place at the turn of the 20th century in Colorado. She also contributed a chapter on the flora and fauna of Lake of the Woods, Oregon, for a history book published in 2019. Originally from Klamath Falls, Ginger lived and worked in New York City for 12 years, Portland for three, Los Angeles for two. She and her husband, Dick, have lived in Bend since 1993. Please welcome Ginger Dellinger. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, good. Okay, uh, just I wanted to let you know, um, when I was in college, I majored in history and I've loved history ever since. So most of my prose is set in the past, not the ancient past. I've never quite tackled that. 
mostly in the early part of the 20th century, maybe even mid-century. Uh, I guess I just feel more comfortable in that particular part of uh, our history. And um, tonight I'm gonna just read a, an excerpt from my second novel, which is titled Never Done. And it takes place prior to the turn of the 20th century and all the way up to about 1919. And it's uh, based on this life of my great grandmother and she had a very difficult life. And there's an awful lot of never done that is um, unfortunate and incidences, sadness. And so I tried to find, I, I picked a part that wasn't so sad. It's January after all, and it's winter. This takes place in about 1887, a little before the turn of the 20th century. And in the first part of this novel, uh, she is living in Conejos County, Colorado, which is about as far south in Colorado as you can get without being in New Mexico. And living in a very, very remote area, very, uh, no neighbors, no schools, not much to do. And her new husband, I mean, basically they've been, they've been married less than a month, has to go on a cattle drive. He has to go because the owner of the cattle is her father. And he's gone for a, a month and a half or so, and then he returns. And so this is when he has come to come back home. And it's winter time, it's cold, and he's covered with snow when he walks into the, this cabin. They're living in a little tiny cabin, like a one room cabin. So that's where this begins. Clara watched with loving eyes as her new husband of two months lathered his face, shaved around his mustache, and then trimmed it with scissors. Clean again and dressed in, dressed in warm clothes, Vincent went outside to take care of his horse while Clara baked a skillet cornbread. It would go well with the split pea soup she made that morning. Their first supper together in a month and a half was relatively quiet. They grinned at one another from time to time, but kept their innermost thoughts to themselves. I will leave the supper dishes until morning, Clara told Vincent after they finished eating. She felt enticingly vulnerable and immodest as she blew out the lantern, shed her corset and shoes, and slipped into her nightdress. Before Vincent went on the drive, the marriage bed had been awkward for them. Clara had barely been hugged and kissed before she got married, and Vincent's only experience was with soiled doves, who pretty much told him what to do. Those lessons didn't last long, and he was usually too drunk to remember the finer points. Shedding the loneliness that had been her constant companion, Clara was an enthusiastic partner when she pulled her freshly saved cowboy into her arms. Vincent was almost giddy to be lying on a mattress again, and so moved by this new kind of affection, he came close to crying. They made love twice and in a mutual need for warmth and intimacy, spooned together until dawn. The next morning, they shared experiences from the 48 days they had been apart. And though Clara had trouble filling up her days while her husband was gone, she did most of the talking. Is that all you remember? She asked after Vincent summarized the two days he and the rest of his crew had spent in Dodge about a minute and a half. Well, Dodge ain't as busy these days, he said. Clara had heard Dodge City described as a cross between Sodom and Gomorrah and a Wild West show. It had to be more interesting than Lahara, the only town less than a day's wagon ride from the cabin, consisting of an old boxcar being used as a train depot and a tiny general store. Lahara hardly qualified as a real town. Clara had been alone in the one-room cabin for weeks. With Vincent home, she had to adjust to sharing it again. They had no sofa, nor was there room for one. So they usually sat at the table or stood by the stove for warmth. If they both happened to be out of their chairs at the same time, they developed a peculiar sort of dance as they moved about the limited space. Three steps forward, duck to avoid the sacks of flour, sugar, and cornmeal hanging from the rafters keep right to avoid a collision, 
and give your partner a whirl if you meet in the middle. To give his bride a small taste of dodge and shorten a few afternoons, Vincent showed her how to play poker. With nothing in their pockets except dreams of the future, they used dried beans to make their wagers. Clara mastered the game quickly, winning beans about as often as she lost them. She soon grew tired of moving small piles of beans back and forth across the table. And the day Vincent won with a full house higher than hers, she gave the poker steaks a rinse and cooked them for supper. <laughs> Yeah. That was great. Thank you, Ginger. You're welcome. Thanks, Ginger. Another thing um, that Ginger shared with us recently is that her short story, Francine, was awarded first runner-up and included in the 2022 Great American Fiction Contest winners anthology sponsored by the Saturday Evening Post. Wow. And oh, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> on the Saturday Evening Post website. When's that, gonna, when's that gonna show up? Ginger? I'm sorry, what was that? Is that gonna be on the uh, Saturday Evening Post website? It's on their website right now um, for a couple of more days. I'm not sure how this working. They seem to be taking, they took the first, the first, the winner, her, her story was on for a week. Mine started last Friday. And it looks to me like hers is still on there. So you can go onto their website and, and read it. Read my story. Set in Klamath Falls. <laughs> yeah, that's very exciting. Okay, well, so we're gonna talk about um, editing. Um, the four of us at this table are professional editors. That sounds probably more impressive, at least for me, that it may be. Um, <clears throat> what it means is that we get paid to help people write stuff. And um, we're just going to talk, we're going to tell a little bit uh, from, uh, that's it, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. 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 Um, so we're each going to say a little something, and then we're going to open it up to questions, okay? And Paige, I'm going to have you probably manage the chat, because I can't see it over here, okay? And if you want to put questions in the chat, feel free to go ahead and do that. If you put the information about Steve and stuff on one. Um, I will. Okay. I can post that after. Steve wouldn't let you on the ladder, so we can No. Okay. <laughs> Since no. there's no one in the front row, are, are we okay to take our masks while we're talking? Paige, are we okay to take our masks off when we're talking? Yep, that's up to you all as people okay. seated next to each other. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep, I'm okay with that. OSHA says okay. Okay. Oh, All right. Go for it. So, <laughs> so when we're talking, we can yeah. take off the mask. Yes. And you're first. <laughs> I'm first. I volunteer to be first. Um, most editors, maybe not most, but this editors. Is Denise Lewis. Oh, she's, very, oh she's a very talented editor. <laughs> okay, now you can start. My name is Denise Hughes Lewis. I'm an award winning kid lit author and an award winning screenwriter. And I also edit and write. Most editors that I know are writers. And I think you almost have to be because we love writing. Editors love writing, no, whether it's ours or anybody else's, we just love it. And it's very important to me to be able to help someone because I didn't get any help when I started writing. It was a long time ago, and they, you know, there wasn't even such a thing as an internet. So <laughs> there wasn't even a computer when I started writing. I had a typewriter that had computer access. It would do three lines automatically. So that was a while ago, and things have really changed since then. So I did it the hard way, taking classes if I was there, driving six hours to a class, driving home the same night after a three hour class. Um, and that's what editors can help with now because of the access of the internet and everything else. It doesn't have to be such a traumatic thing. The trauma probably involved with most writers is the fact that it's expensive to have an editor. We just don't, we can't do it for nothing because we spend our lives learning how to do it and learning how to write. 
and um, Mike will give me some figures of what it, what we charge and what other other people charge. What I want to say is that don't ever give up writing. Keep doing it. But there's a lot that you can do that you can help yourself with before you ever see an, an editor. Here's one of the books that I recommend to everybody called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. It's easy to read, it's easy to understand, and if you do what it says, you will have a great novel. The author of the original Save the Cat's books was a screenwriter, and he's no longer alive. So this is a lady who took his, his course, changed it into what you need to do for a novel, and it's a great book. Another thing that you need when you're writing is if you don't have an emotional connection to your reader, you might as well not write. There's a book called The Emotional Craft of Fiction by Donald Mass, M-A-A-S-S. Moss, sorry, Moss. Um, this will help you immensely in bringing your characters to life and adding depth to your stories. Now you have, now you've supposedly written your novel. You've, you've given it to friends, but when I say friends, I mean friends who will tell you the truth, not friends who will say that's great, I love it. You want somebody who's actually going to give you feedback on how you can improve your writing. And you need to do that two or three or four times or however many times you can get somebody to read your novel because it will help have it be better for when you do hand it to an editor. Here's another book called Self-Editing for Fiction Writers. You need to self-edit before you ever give it to us because you're going to save yourself a lot of money. If we have to do everything for you, it's going to cost a lot. I never paid for editing in, until one time where I actually had some money to do it. I didn't know what I was doing, except this was a good editor. She had a lot of credentials, and it cost me $3,500. But I had sent it to a lot of friends and a lot of people who gave me good feedback. And I would say that at, for the $3,500, she probably changed five or 10 sentences in the entire book. So you can do a lot of editing with your friends and coworkers or co-writers before you ever send it to an editor. And that's what I would recommend because it's expensive. Now there are all kinds of editing and that will be listed in our, are they going to be PDFs on the website? Yeah, I'll post, um, when we get the recording of this, I'll post the PDFs right, right. next to those on the website. Because I don't want to list what kinds of, of editing there, there are. Well, but then there are four of us, one of us will do that. Yeah, right. Julie will do that. Right. Oh, good. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will. All right. <laughs> I'll just tell you what I do because um, I can't just say, okay, I'm only going to proofread, I'm only going to copy edit. I do the whole thing because the whole, to me, the book is a whole thing. And you have to start out with the structure and be sure the structure is right and everything is working correctly before you ever worry about whether you have a sentence structure correct, whether you're spelling it, whether it needs proofreading. So that's content editing or developmental editing and that's what I really like to do. I think I have a, a, a unique perspective because I'm also a screenwriter and screenwriters are supposed to write in the most terse, short way they can to get the point across emotionally and uh, description-wise. And it's quite a different format than a novel, but it does help me in editing and seeing what you need and what you can get rid of in your story. So that's kind of what I do, and I love to do it. And um, I recommend these books, they'll help you first. All right, Julie. Okay. Um, so my name is Julie. Um, I have been a professional editor for almost five years. I have a master's degree from uh, Portland State University in book publishing. And during that program, it's an actual uh, full functioning publishing press. We work on anywhere from two to four books during those two years. I was the project manager for two young adult novels. Um, we also republished uh, Ricochet River, which if anybody is familiar with, uh, is an Oregon-based author and novel. Um, we republished the 25th anniversary edition of that book and actually edited it for some of the more, um, I guess you would call it un-PC, but some of the really rough content that that book originally had. Um, so I've been, like I said, editing uh, professionally for almost five years. I uh, started my own company last year called Quail Run Editorial. 
I like Denise tend to go more on the developmental side. I really like a rough and raw manuscript that basically needs to be unearthed like you would, you know, a flower. Um, I'm yes. not. Oh, we have to do that. Um, I am a trained copy editor, but the mechanics of copy editing sometimes I want to fight with the rules. Um, so I like developmental editing because I think it's where you can kind of start to realize that you break the rules in your own style of writing, in your own voice, in the genre that you want to write in. Um, and I specialize in young adult and memoir. Um, so I've worked on memoirs over the last five years about opioid addiction, um, spousal abuse, and other, you know, family abuse. And one of my favorite things about reading memoir in general is just finding out about other people's lives. I mean, I think everybody has such an interesting story to tell um, outside of, you know, famous people telling their memoirs. I really like just reading somebody's that's like, this is what I did with my life. And that's one of the reasons I've specialized in that as an editor. Um, I also have a marketing background. So I owned a couple of uh, direct sales businesses, but did a lot of like social media marketing. And I'm currently the events manager at Roundabout Books up in Northwest Crossing. So I have a big background in book events. And so that can really help me, I think, as an editor. When I'm reading your book and looking at it and saying, how are you marketing this? Because if you don't know that, and I don't know that your reader is nowhere and your bookstore is nowhere. So if you need that kind of help to define who your reader is, where you're going to find them, what keywords are going to get them interested in your book, that's where I really like being able to still work at a bookstore and find what people are still reading and really liking and those weird books that people pick up that are not on the bestseller list and they come back in and tell me it's the best books they've ever read. So yeah, come and see us at Roundabout too, please, um, in the bookstores. So that's my thing. Yeah. All right, Trish. Um, well, that's, that's awesome. I didn't know all those things about you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, I could take this off. Oh, no. So I, I love editing and I, I got it. So here, this is the really exciting thing. So you write your book, you finish writing the entire thing and you're, you're like, I'm done. And, and, and here's the thing, the rewriting is actually a lot of people say, oh, I don't like the rewriting, but that's the most fun because then you get to flesh it all out and create things we can see and create feelings that we can feel. And when you write something and it makes you a little teary, you're like, yes, because you know that that's going to, that's going to touch your reader. And that's what I like to create. Just, just the, the experience of reading. So I do a lot of what she does. She's much better at all the key words and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, um, I do all the different kinds of editing, but I will tell you that I wrote a book called Brain Stages, How to Raise Smart, Confident Kids and Have Fun Doing It. And that's kind of blown up into a whole bunch of workshops and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I just did something for the Great Neck School District in New York. <laughs> um, so, so I only edit one book at a time. I mean, I, I'm just letting you know that I've edited young adult fiction and memoir for the same reason. I love memoir, fleshing out the scenes because a lot of times when you're telling about your life, you're saying this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. I'm saying, okay, now I need to see it. I can't see this. And it's so fun to just flesh all that out and then people remember so much more. And it's, it's just a really exciting thing to do. And that is the developmental part of it. But once you finish writing your draft, go out and celebrate and put it away for, I, I like to tell people, put it away for like a month or two. And then don't even look at it so that when you look at it next and it's fresh, because so much will come to your mind, whether you are in fiction or nonfiction, it doesn't matter. And when you're writing nonfiction, writing narrative nonfiction, you're writing it like a story. So story structure is so, so important. What's the inciting incident? What, what gets that story moving? Which is so fun to help people flesh out. Because a lot of times what editors do, so you're having other friends read it, 
with you, right? And you have people giving you feedback. Maybe you're in a writing group, which I would highly recommend <laughs> to be in a writing group with other people who love story, who love writing. And so you're having them work with you and you know, kind of give you ideas and saying, well, I can't see this and I can see that. Oh, well, this happened before and that's not consistent with that because there are all kinds of inconsistencies. So you're straightening out all those things first. You're using movement instead of describing everything. The mountains look like this and this looks like it smelled like this. And um, putting in a whole bunch of that, maybe a couple of sentences is great. So because we need to be in the scene so first part out of the box in the scene, put us somewhere that we can see. Does that make sense? Let us see where you are. Once we see where you are, then you can show your characters or your real people, whatever, moving within your scene so that we can see the movement and the, the character gets revealed. We get to see things about the characters and their habits and how they move and what they do. And that's, that's the part that I like really working with people and that's kind of developmental part of it, but it's also style and just pulling out the best in you. Does that make sense? A lot of, a lot of what we do as editors is we pull out the, the best in you so your writing shines. I, I, hope, that's, I hope that makes sense. On, on a whole different level, like somebody will give me a scene, we'll work on a scene together and they'll go, you know, Trish, I read that scene when I first brought it to you and like it, the same things happen, but it's, it's just so completely different. And I feel like I'm sitting in the room and it's exactly, I'm, I'm reliving it again when I say it, it's exactly, that's, that's exactly where I want you to be. And it's the same way with fiction with our characters because how they move and the things they do and the things they keep to themselves, as well as what they're saying out loud, especially if there's some kind of discrepancy and if it's in their point of view. You know, then we get to see different layers of that character and we get to see when there's subtext going on and all of those things. And you, you just can't get all the sub, subtext and characterization and all that stuff done in that first draft. So the first draft is way, let, wow, let's celebrate. And then you go through it and revise it and flesh out the scenes as much as you can. You work with a writing group and flesh it out some more, especially if it's your first book. And then you bring it to an editor when you feel like you have all the pieces together to the best of your ability, because then we can, re then we, we can really spend the time just creating it, making it blossom. It's, it's like you're putting in all the outlines, you, you've got some color in there, you have some of it together, and then the, the editor just kind of <laughs> makes, it, makes it explode into the story that it deserves to be. All right. Um, I agree with everything that <laughs> these three said. I have a little quote that I, um, I have lots of little quotes taped to the edges of my computer monitor. My most recent one is from Zadie Smith. And it says the secret to editing your work is simple. You need to become its reader instead of its writer. Mm -hmm. I am a shitty reader of my own work. <laughs> I don't read my work well. And so I, I don't know, I, I think it's there, right? Um, Trish talked about putting uh, putting your piece away for a month. Twenty years would be good for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I've actually found work that I've written a long time ago, and I'm so dissociated from from it that I can actually treat it like a, a story, like a, a separate thing that's not involved in me because I don't even remember what the hell I was thinking when I was writing it. Right? That's what an editor does. I just got a lovely rejection from an agent uh, this week for a novel that I've been shopping. And she, she told me, you know, you've got, you're missing the emotional arc of the story in the middle. I tell this to people all the time, <laughs> right? Because I can see that they're missing the emotional arc. I can't see it in my own work. And this is the benefit of an editor. She said, go get an editor. That's what she told me, this agent, right? So editors need editors too. Mm -hmm. So the idea here um, is that you're, 
is that you you live in your mind you have your all the causes and conditions and experiences that have brought you to where you are and when you write something you come from a particular mindset right this is why i absolutely agree with it. getting a writing group getting a friend who is honest and doesn't just say wow that's great uh, wow, that's great. Good. Have that friend too. Definitely have that friend. <laughs> but know that that's that friend and give it to him first and possibly again after you've had the friend who said that wasn't so great, right? Um, it, it's, uh, we're putting a lot out on the page. So um, my role in editing, and, and we've talked about developmental editing or content editing or uh, copywriting, so on and so forth. So the word edit um, is actually a verb that came from a noun. The noun happened first. So addition is something that we put out into the world to share with others, right? To get ready for an addition is to edit. Editing is to get something ready for publication. That's what it is, right? And there's different kinds of editing, right? Um, I focus on content editing, the big picture, what's happening in the story. Um, if you have a story, um, you know, flow, chronology, pacing, all the things that, that make the story work. Um, that's what I love to do. I also do copy editing, but I charge by the hour. And when I copy edit, I read slow and it costs you a lot of money. Everyone has a friend who's a grammar Nazi, right? Mm -hmm. We all do. Give it to them first. If you have issues with grammar, give it to your, to your, my, your mom. Right? I mean, whoever it is, <laughs> I, I, I have students, I teach comp, and I have a lot of students who give their work to their mom, right? To fix their mistakes. Like, absolutely, right? You don't have to learn all that stuff if somebody else is going to do it for you, but don't pay me personally for that. I think you all do some copy edit work, right? I, I like I said, I charge, a, I, I charge by the hour and I read really slow when I copy edit. I read pretty fast when, I, when I'm going through for content, right? Mm -hmm. um, Couple other things that uh, that uh, so Denise mentioned. You know, this the the books that she mentioned are great um, for your own purpose. When you're looking at your work, say the cat um, is is a is a great. Here's how a story works. You got this. You got this. You got this. You got this. If you like that sort of thing, or you can follow many of the the plot outlines or whatever are out there in the world. Make sure that you've got an actual plot in your story, right? The emotional aspect is why we read. That's what a story is. The story changes us emotionally. That's what happens. And if you don't have that in there, then you're then you're missing out. And Donald Moss has some great stuff in that book to do. Um, the self-editing thing, I think, is probably a little bit more technical stuff, right? A little bit more how to how to do this, that, and the other thing. These these physical things. But they're they're a great set of books. Um, if you have a great writing group and you've got different people in there that look at different aspects of it, that's great. You can get a lot done in a writing group. Um, but to prepare something for publication, if you're saying this is the novel and I want to publish it, and as Trish said, when you've written the first one, and so many people do this, I'm done. I nailed it. I wrote that novel. It took me three months, six months, a year, two years, I wrote it, right? And they think they're done. And it's just getting started, right? And to give it to an editor can help move that much more quickly than you sitting down and going through I, this novel that I'm talking about that I shot. I can't tell you how many times I've rewritten it because I think something that's like, oh, I could get more emotion in it there, right? And so now I go back and rewrite the whole thing to do that. But an, an editor could help me say, Mike, here's the arc you want. This should happen here. This should happen here. Here's ways to make that happen. Here's where you're dragging. Here's where you're, uh, you're telling too much and not showing enough. Here's where you're showing too much and not telling enough and, and all that sort of stuff, right? So editors are good critical readers and that's, it's a really useful thing to do. And it's worth the money. Maybe not $3,500 for five sentences. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but you, um, you know, so that your editors, I know these people and I trust them. Um, I trust me too. You may not, but, um, but, uh, but I trust, I trust these people and I trust that they'll give you good feedback. There are plenty of other people out there in the world that will do that for you as well. Um, it's, 
it's worth it. It's a it's a small expense, um, and it will help you get um, get that get your piece read by an agent or a publication or a, a publishing house more quickly and easily than slogging away at it on your on your own. And there are other parts of it. Like if you want to be traditional, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. should I've done it? <laughs> I was done. I needed if, somebody to cut it. Okay. If you if you want to be traditionally published, have an editor help you with um, with like your query letter, how which agents to go to, what to tell them, how to sell your book, what what's gonna work for that. I mean, there are all kinds of things to look at for um, you know, how to write a query letter, but it's also really helpful to talk to an editor who knows what they're looking at for um, for a query letter so that you get a response for what's going on with your, you know, if you want to be published for something else. So I work with a lot of self-published authors um, who just want their product out there and don't want to go through the traditional route. And a lot of times what we end up doing is we work together to write your synopsis and what you're going to put on the back and what you're going to put on Amazon and what you're going to put on your website. Right. Because if they are having a hard time, if you're having a hard time boiling it down to a hundred words, the person who's probably read it two or three times is going to be able to help you pick out those really big plot points that is what you need on the back of a book. Um, so Mike mentioned, you know, finding or an editor. And I wanted to talk to uh, everybody about kind of some of the ways you find an editor. So. We have that listed on the Central Oregon Writers Guild website, but I'm a member of the Northwest Editors Guild, which is um, based out of Seattle, but covers Washington, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, and parts of Canada. Um, if for some reason you wrote a book that's centered in Canada, hire a Canadian editor. Mm -hmm. um, I love the Northwest Editors Guild. Uh, they do a lot for editors and just for the education of authors on how to find an editor. And one of the things that I love about them um, as a smaller group outside of places like, um, so ACES is another website for editors and to find them. They used to be just for copy editors. They have since um, absorbed kind of another group and it's just all editors of any level are, you can find them on there. Um, they don't list any rates. However, the Editorial Freelancers Association does. It also has a guide or a directory of editors. One of the things though that I like about the Northwest Editors Guild is they recently sent out a survey to every single editorial member of their uh, guild and asked for their rates. So the Northwest Editors Guild has the most up-to-date median rates of what an editor will charge you. If you're going to places like Fiverr and Upwork and someone saying, I can edit your 100,000 word manuscript for $500, they're running it through Grammarly and giving it back to you. Yeah. And unfortunately that happens and it really devalues your work and our work. I'm not saying you need to pay someone $5,000 to edit. If someone quotes you that, I would be highly suspecting of what they're going to do for you. But somewhere around $2,000 to $2,500 is probably what you're going to pay for a first round developmental edit. Um, and the way that a lot of editors and the way that the guild breaks down those rates is by the hour. But we all have internal and things that we've been taught over the years by other editors, by the guild, and, and et cetera, is a formula. So we take your word count, we divide it by how many pages that actually is, even though it says something else in Microsoft Word, it's not right. And then we say, okay, depending on the level of editing you need and the sample I've seen, do never hire an editor without giving them a sample. If they don't ask for it, don't hire them, right? If they ask for it and you feel uncomfortable, please understand we do not want to steal your work. We don't have time. We're not going to try and steal your idea and write a brand new book and try and sell it to somebody. And so not truthfully, if you've written it, it's copyrighted. Yeah. yeah, you it's, have it on your computer, it's, it's already done. It, it, it exists. But I need to see those first 25 pages to understand if you need a heavy developmental edit. If you need a line edit, this you, you've put it through your writing critique group, your friends, your family, a beta reader. And I'm like, oh, this is a memoir I'm working on right now. Excellent, I just need to really do a cleanup and ask you 10 to 20 questions bonus like 
this is good for me too. But if you don't send me that sample and I have made the mistake of agreeing to an edit without seeing the sample, and it was very hard on both of us. I, I think I may have cried at one point um, <laughs> because I don't know what you've got. I really don't. I don't know if it's something I'm qualified to work on. You know, your subject matter, your the time you put into it. So always, always give somebody a sample. And when you work with an editor, it, the, a lot of people think I'm going to send this to an editor. They're going to mark it up and give it back to me and I'm going to publish it. <laughs> That's not kind of how it goes. You will, you will have an ongoing relationship with an editor. You will get feedback, you will shift it, you will give it back to the editor, the editor will say that's great, and the time gets shorter and shorter. But um, the idea that you're going to hand somebody a 300, 500 page manuscript, have them mark it up, give it back to you, you fix it and send it off, that's, that generally isn't how, how it's going to work. Unless, as Julie said, you've, you know, and some people are great self-editors and maybe their writing group helped or maybe their mom helped or whatever. Um, <laughs> And they've got it pretty pretty wired in, but you definitely want to have a consultation or uh, share those first twenty five pages and get feedback because it could be anything. And could that's why I go ahead. I have a question. Could one of you define what you an example of uh, copy editing? And you mentioned content editing. <coughs> so. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to know how you find that. Yeah, so my, simple, copy my simple bit. answer for that is content is the is the aboutness of it, what the story is about, the, the the story arc and all that sort of stuff. Copy editing to me gets down to putting in comments. Yeah, it's mechanical. Okay. So and what do you uh, what do you define your editing when you said someone handed you a manuscript that's pretty well ready to go, and now you're going to move them into the marketing and you're going to do the Synopsis and so forth. Do you consider that uh, copy editing, or what do you consider that? Okay, so so we've got kind of your. There's about four things that an editor can do for you. So one of the first things that I really want to talk about that I don't think enough people know about is what's called a manuscript evaluation. And for me personally, how I was taught to do them and the way that I perform them is, I am reading through like I'm a beta reader but I am going to give you eight to 10 pages of feedback. What is working? What isn't? Was I offended? Was, is your reader going to be offended? Did this make absolutely no sense, et cetera? But I'm not marking anything on the manuscript because I'm just saying to you, this is what I think you've got. This is my recommendation for your next level. Now I've done a manuscript evaluation where the next thing, all I needed to do was a copy edit. She had written such a beautiful book that I was like, I'm just going to clean up your grammar go for it. The next thing, the, the, what you'll see on different websites called content developmental and sometimes substantive is that first level that a lot of times what Mike is talking about too is where I, we're taking your manuscript and we're saying, we're going to read through the whole thing, but then we're going to mark up exactly where I'm saying, I don't understand what's happening. Your character is in his head, but I'm not. I just got done with a fiction book where I had to say that. I'm like, you know what your character is doing and I don't. And it's the same when I'm telling a story to somebody out loud. I know the background, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So that developmental editing, I'm not worried about commas, spelling. I run a spell check on every single manuscript because it makes me feel better. And I run a program called Perfect It, which is kind of that same thing, looking for just weird spellings of things. But I'm not trying to change your grammar on that level because you're going to end up rewriting something and if I perform a copy edit I'm doing double work and it's not going to help you or me at all. The next level what I call a line level line level and sometimes it's also still called substantive is what a lot of people call a lighter developmental edit or that cross between developmental and copy edit. So again I might get a manuscript where I'm going I'm finding very few grammar errors. I'm finding very few content errors in the sample. So I'm gonna say, hey, let's just do this kind of lighter, but still I'm looking at every sentence. And I'm saying, you mentioned this one person, but they don't come back for a hundred pages. So, so now you're off, your readers forgotten who they are and why they matter to the story. So where, where are they, where'd they go? Or 
you just change their name on accident. And they jump out with a gun. All yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and that level can still ask for some rewrites where I can say, hey, again, I don't understand what this person's doing. Your tension's not there. I mean, it's almost there, but not quite. So rewrite maybe this one or two sections. In a copy edit, my thought and most people I know is, if I'm finding massive errors in your manuscript at a copy edit level, it's not ready for a copy edit. Because after a copy edit, you're just, or I'm fixing those mechanical errors and no rewriting should be happening. Because then I'm gonna need to copy edit those sections and rewrote again anyway. And then after that, if you're gonna self-publish, you're gonna need a proofreader, or if your designer does proofreads, et cetera, that's so mechanical, it's not really worth mentioning. I love a proofread though. <laughs> I love a proofread. It's very fun. We got questions, Paige? Yeah, are y'all ready? Yes. Right. Did that answer your question? Right. Should yes, we ask you. the people who are in the room yeah. first yeah. if you have questions? Did anybody? Could, could I ask you one thing? On your memes editing, you, you say you'd read a whole manuscript without marking it up. On a right. manuscript evaluation. Okay, so do you usually ask to do that first? That's more of a conversation when I start talking with someone. When someone reach out, reaches out to me and says, I think I'm ready for an editor. And I say, okay, has your manuscript been looked at by a critique group? Are you looking for someone to rip it apart? Or do you just want to know if it's ready for the next level? Because I've had a few people that have said, I really don't know what I want to do. And I maybe have a small budget. Okay, let me do a manuscript evaluation. That's maybe only five or six hundred dollars. Okay, uh, for what? Two hundred thousand words. What would five hundred dollars? Um, between like seventy-five thousand and a hundred thousand. If you're coming to me with a two hundred thousand word manuscript, we're having a different conversation. Okay, because <laughs> that's probably two that. books. Yeah. <laughs> The, um, Thank you. Things are different per person as well. So I have had manuscript evaluations where I, and what I normally do is I'll read through, I'll do kind of chapter summaries, and then I'll do a, the, the whole art, and I'll say, this works, this doesn't work, this is missing, so on and so forth. I've had people who have done that for and give it to them, and they walk off and say, thank you. It's usually where I start. I've also worked with people who are in the middle of writing something. I've actually done developmental editing, editing while we were writing it. Like I'm up to page whatever. And I've worked with people where I've met them on a weekly basis, uh, bi-weekly basis or whatever. And they're handing me new pages, right? And we're help and I'm helping them. It's almost like co-writing in that, in that way, yeah. right? So it goes across the board and it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, but generally, um, a consultation is a good thing to do. And, and, you know, I charge 50 bucks for a consultation. And my consultation is, what do you want to do? What do we got? We'll look at your work and let's talk about what you want to do. And then, I think another important thing is, this is a relationship. So you want to really be able to work with someone and listen to what they have to say. And it goes both ways. I mean, I've edited books where the person will listen to everything you say and do nothing. You don't want, you know, that's hard because you're not doing your job, you're not being allowed to do your job, and they're not learning what they need to, to do. So it's very important to be careful about how you choose an editor and know that you can work with them and that it's a give and take. And as um, one of you said, we, we know some tricks. And um, a lot of times, and we talked when we talked about this before, it's not just editing. It's also literally instruction. I mean, um, my, my idea when I work with people for a long time is not to produce the fish, it's to learn how to fish. It's how, and so what I've what I found, is, as I said, with people who I'm working with in progress, their writing gets better and better and better and better. And I have to do less and less and less editing because we learned that in chapter three. And then we learned this in chapter four. And then we talk about story arc in chapter five and so on and so forth. And that becomes part of, of what they do, right? So it's a little bit of, it depends on who you're working with and what you're planning. It can become a writing workshop as well as an, an editing thing. And that depends on the editor too. Like I think all of us, 
on some level are teachers. Like I started out as a teacher before an editor. So I started calling myself a writing coach <laughs> because I don't, if you don't want to be coached at all, I am not, I am not your editor. I, I mean, just so, just so you know that. I, <laughs> because, because I, I only work on projects that I love and I get excited about your work and, you know, you have to be willing to work on it and flesh it out and, and get excited about it with me. <laughs> right. So, so it's kind of a coaching relationship more than, um, more than just an editing thing. I mean, I do, you know, I, I do, uh, I do, I do proofreads and um, line editing and stuff like that, but I think all the creative part, the part that's really fun is helping you create your story. But I very often end up doing the proofreading and stuff at the end. If I put it away, I can see, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a Virgo, I'm a total stickler. <laughs> So, I mean, if a comma is missing or in the wrong place, even the professional books that I read, I'm like, oh, they, they had this done at Random House. This oh, should yeah. be right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they sneak through. I found it. I actually found a typo in Hillary Clinton's memoir. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought I had lost my mind. And I sent it to a friend, and I was like, that should be feel. And it's fell. She's like, yep. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh no! And, I and mean, it's amazing because they'll have like twelve people happens. looking at it. Yep. And they still, it still, it's still, happens. it's an it's automatic just, thing, yeah. and that's why you should always print your book out and read it because what you see online is different than what you see on paper, and you can still make mistakes and you can still miss things. I'm yeah. even so glad things. you said that because also the thing that I wanted to say that I forgot <laughs> is read your work, especially if you're a first time person, but always is good. Read your work out loud mm -hmm. because when you can hear i i still do that i'm i'm a published author i write fiction and nonfiction. i still read my work out loud all the time because i catch new things there's a whole and i do all this brain stuff right part of it is just using another sense you're using your sight and you're using your sense of hearing and that connects other neural pathways in your brain so, and I know you think it's crazy, but before I did that, before I recorded brain stages for the audiobook, I had read the entire book out loud before I sent it back to the publisher. I do that too with my work. I read, I read the entire novel out loud in one sitting. In one sitting. Yeah. Ooh. All right, Paige, All right let's take one from the uh, audience real quick. Hey, Andrew, you had your hand up. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Just real quick, um, I was kind of wondering what each of the specialties were for each of the author or for the editors up there. Just kind of like I know that Julie mentioned young adult and uh, memoir. Kind of like to know what each person's specialty is, and just have that in chat for us. Uh, so I will say that I've edited everything from uh, children's picture books, middle grade uh, fiction, up to, like I said, nonfiction. I've done a medical book about um, reproductive history and a real estate book. The only genre that I will turn you down is sci-fi fantasy. I will send you to someone else or my best friend in Portland. It is not my genre. I don't read it, so I don't edit it. I'll take the sci-fi okay. fantasy. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I have done, uh, you know, to me, writing is writing. So uh, I've done memoir, I've done fiction, I've done uh, sci-fi, I've done epic fantasy, um, YA, um, children's books, I've done all those different things. And to me, like I said, good writing is good writing. So I, I, I don't have a, a, a specialty per se. I don't have a specialty either, although I would say that I wouldn't prefer not to edit poor. That's the only thing that's me. Because of the dreams. No, just because I don't, because I live books, I feel them, mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel yeah. that in a horror. That's why I don't watch horror movies. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I just uh, went through uh, went through a book with a serial killer. Oh it, no! Yeah, so oh. bad dreams. But bad dreams. Um, oh no! Can't but, can't handle uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't deal with horror either. I just and you said it exactly. I feel books. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. 
Stephen King won't be calling you. Uh, and, no, and I've actually, I've yeah, actually absolutely. read a couple of his books that have given me such bad nightmares that, I mean, I think he's a wonderful writer, which is why I've read Stephen King books, but I just, I read part of one of his, and I did read the only sci-fi that I think he wrote for kids. Yeah, he can do 200,000 words in one room. Yeah, yeah, but the book that he wrote called Dragon's Eye or something like that. I is, have a neat no, Oh, it's absolutely right. yeah. unbelievable it was awesome. because I know every, every single person's <laughs> point of view is in it. Yes. And it's fantasy, and I love fantasy and sci-fi. So I could live with that because it didn't have all the horror elements in it. But that's the only one I think he's ever written. It's a really good book. Too. Yeah, if you haven't read that. <laughs> It's really right. fun. Okay, good lead in the um, next I, question. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, Trish, go ahead. I, I was just going to say I've edited all kinds of things too. What I've edited most probably is memoir, although I'm doing an eagle book with a, you guys may know Jack Mullen. He's a sea captain. And man, that book is coming out amazing. I am so excited. And he already thinks he may have somebody from Pixar interested. So is it a kid's we're book? really excited. Is it a kid's book? It's yes, but it's layered kind of like a Disney thing. I mean, it's it's anyway, so fun. We've had and and I've pretty much co-written that book. So like you were talking about, we do it on all kinds of different levels. Jack wasn't going to be able to create the subtext and the, you know, all the anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, um, I do all kinds of different things. I love them all. I can't do horror. I don't generally do poetry. I can't do poetry at all. Um, and children's books, it depends on the children's book. Um, so, and I'll be honest. I mean, if I look at somebody's work and I say, um, this isn't probably my thing, but I mean, I know a lot of editors, so I send them, like I, I sent books to editors. I, I know her. Excellent poetry editor that, um, <laughs> that I live with. Irene is also in part of the Blank Pages writing uh, workshops. So if you're if you're looking for a poetry editor, yeah. And if you haven't done Blank Pages, it's a really cool thing. It's not expensive, and they do such a great job. It's so much fun. So if you haven't done Blank Pages, definitely check that out. Thanks, Thanks for that. So let's say that you have a piece and you send it to an editor and they say, well, this isn't my genre. How do you find somebody who specializes in your genre so you don't get turned away at the door? Well, my uh, advice would be to first go to the Central Oregon Writers Guild website because the editors that are listed there all have uh, web, their own websites and we, for the most part, I list the genres that I'll work on. But if you are not using one of us, uh, go to one of these other websites like the Northwest Editors Guild or EFA. You can actually put in the filters of uh, developmental editing for memoir within 50 miles of you because maybe you want to meet them in person. They have all of those filters to find out. And that's actually how I have found several clients or they've found me because I'm one of the only memoir editors listed on the Northwest Editors Guild. So. If they don't have their genres listed, you want. Yeah, or ask. Or just, you know, if, hey, yeah, if you talk to some, hey, Mike and yeah. you say, you know, I, here's my work. Yeah, send And it, he says, send, I don't do this. Send an email. Oh, yeah, hey, we all I'm, know somebody. Hey, I've got a, a yeah. horror book um, that I'm looking for an editor. Do you do that? And, you know, the worst that you'll get is no. Uh, the best you'll get is no, but Fred does. And here's his contact info. Yeah. Yeah, because we know a lot. Of, yeah. yeah. So usually if you talk to an editor and we're pretty good about because we want the best job done. Does that make sense? I mean, if you send us something and we look at it, we're not just like, oh, I have to have this. But I mean, I have to love whatever I'm working on because that's when I do my best work for the people I work with. So any questions in the room? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Um, this is going to take the discussion, if we have one, uh, probably onto a much, not a higher plane necessarily, but a different one. I'm, uh, I'm driven primarily in reading, and I'm almost totally fiction, even though I've been, got a journalism background. Uh, <clears throat> so the heart 
but not necessarily in a romantic way. It's really, I think, the gut. And I wonder if the gut is a successful character for, in general, for a lot of novels out there. In fact, that maybe way a lot of them come in. They're really, they're telling you wonderful, complicated stories. Uh, but what really gets to you is not all the crazy things they may have done in places they've gone, but it's it's the gut, yours and the characters. Is that the beginning of a clue uh, as to what we ought to be, no, not what we ought to be doing, what, the, what we might want to consider uh, if we're going off uh, on a writing bench without really totally knowing <laughs> where it's going to go? Uh, any thoughts? Well, your gut is your emotions. It's how you feel inside. And if you don't have any emotional connection mm -hmm. to the story yourself, how are you going to project it to your reader? So it's essential. Yes, it's yeah. it's yeah. primary number one. Okay. It's the it's the definition of story. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is the definition. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, the right. book. I, I, would, I've yeah. seen some of I mean, books. and and he's a I have taken it. Yeah, and he's a publisher. Just, be, just because I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a really, I'm really always kind of surrounded by fiction stuff. I read so much of it and long books, tough books, all that sort of thing. But what I get out of it a lot of times when I leave is I can't stand to leave that, that character. I just, mm -hmm. you know. Because I miss they them. Mean, I, I slip, they're like a friend. I'm yeah, I don't want to reach friend. back into yeah. the book and say, I'll help you, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Is anybody here willing to uh, say this is my favorite author and explain the relationship of that person, writer, to the emotion factor? So there's probably only one author besides Stephen King that I have read multiple of their books, and I know that that they have their fans and their detractors, and that's Jody Pico who does yeah. a lot of the rip from the headlines. Mm -hmm. But I have loved every single one of those books. Whatever she is doing, the formula, whatever. The very first one was My Sister's Keeper, which the movie is terrible. Mm -hmm. The book is amazing. I was supposed to go to dinner with somebody. I'm sitting, they're like, let's go. I'm like, I will finish this book. You will shut up. <laughs> I was I, I'm like, no, I'm not moving. I could not wait to get through that one. And so many of her books deal with really scary stuff. There's one called 19 Minutes, which is about a school shooting. I listened to it on audio, which I don't know how that didn't give me bad dreams. I was ready to cry because I was just, I was so in it. Yeah. But I will say recently, um, so like my top books for last year, um, I finished The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which V.E. Schwab is a very well-known author. She has a plethora of books under both that name and Victoria Schwab. I was wrecked. I like couldn't read anything for like two weeks because I finished it and I was like, more, yeah. I need more. It was so beautiful. But the one book that I will read about every five years is The Red Tent by Anita Diamond. I love that book. I've not read anything else by her. I know she's a great writer, but that book, I, I hand sell that book at, Bar at Barnstone. I used to work there at Roundabout. Anytime someone says, what's your favorite book? I'm gonna grab, I love that book. Thank you. It gives me emotion. If it's from your guy. Mm -hmm. Well, and, it, and it, that one too, of so many of these, if you think like, why does the book connect with you? Is it because it makes you miss somebody you love? It makes you think of something from your past. With that book, especially, I was raised in the church. So to take a religious mm -hmm. story and then flesh it out as if they're real people, which when I read it, I was like 22, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Where I was like, how do you, that also was one of those things where I was like, how did she do this? Mm -hmm. I want to edit a book like this. I thought I was going to write the next a great American novel. I want to edit the next great American novel. Denise, how about you? I like children's authors because I write for children. So, um, and at, at my age, I would rather escape than read real life things. 
So that's why I like fantasy and sci-fi. I like to make things up. I like to read that. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy reading other things too, but my choice of reading has to do with entertaining me and making me feel something. And I, I but I don't wanna, you know, be torn apart because I real life can tear you apart. I've had enough of that. I want to enjoy a book <laughs> and not have to be torn apart. Super. A lot of people who like that. Yeah. <laughs> And that's probably why I write a lot of screenplays. I'm into writing screenplays more right at the moment than writing books because um, I like, I see things in pictures. It's a visual thing. But the ones that I like to see are still going to make me laugh or they're going to make me feel, but they're not going to make me feel horrible. That's just me. Cool. Pollyanna. <laughs> I, I'm like that too. I was thinking, you know, um, one of my favorites for sure is Scott Westerfeld, but I also write young adult fiction besides. Anyway, um, there are always people, I, I read a lot of people, but I think there are always authors that make me feel. I mean, I, I think that's just an absolute ingredient. That said, I don't think like best selling books are not necessarily um, literary fiction. Like Jodi Picoult, she is the one who gets away with more than most other writers. But I will say her, I love her writing too, but, but I'll be wrecked for weeks mm -hmm. after I read one of her books because they, they often have surprise, mm -hmm. horrible endings. <laughs> And, and I and I don't I'm like Denise maybe because we're older <laughs> but but I read for if, especially if I'm going to read for fiction I read for entertainment it is not entertaining to me to have something horrible happen to the end of these characters that I've gotten so close to so Jodi Picola is an amazing writer, but I, I do not love that. And, and in Europe, it's all the rage, have a horrible ending to a story. Um, that's, just, that's just not my thing. It's not entertaining for me, so. I kind of agree on that, the children's books. Um, I, you know, fortunately, having had children and reading books to so children, many of them, I mean, yeah. they are all emotional art. That's what they do, right? Um, guess how much I love you. Good night, moon. Books that I read to my kids. That I'm just even saying that out loud gets me teared up, right? Um, we we watched every Disney film, and my children would look at me, waiting for me to cry. <laughs> like, you gonna you gonna cry, Dad? And I would, um, because that's what they're doing. They're they're tapping into the. I mean, they spend years writing those those films and years making them and it's emotional art emotional art emotional art they, they do it to a t um i grew up you know during my angsty teen years i was drawn to the the writers of my day which were actually probably a little before my day but you know salinger carter hemingway the realist writers who say this is something that just happened and there's here's the emotional heart of it right um and I carried those through in my angsty 20s and into my angsty 30s. And those are, that's what that's how I write now. I write realist short, uh, short fiction is, is my primary mode. And I'm trying to capture what they, what, how they made me feel. And that's all it is, is how it makes me feel. I don't, when I tell somebody a story, if I, if I tell you uh, the plot of A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, um, I can tell you what happened, but I, I cannot grasp the the heart the the heart wrenching moment that happens at the end of it you know right. i mean i just oh. i can't I, but i can feel it and i love feeling it so yeah but that's what that's what writing to me is about that's that's why we do it well the yeller was a great yeah. children's book with a horrible yeah, yeah. that's true yeah, and, and i, was, I did read I it you're right <laughs> yeah oh i never I kill read. a dog in a yeah. novel <laughs> people will quit reading it yeah, they, 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 <laughs> the you it, book? I, oh, killed, oh, I, killed, I killed a dog off. And oh. People wrote me and said I quit reading. Yeah. So to your point, you know, be yeah. be careful with that stuff. It could be called save the cat. <laughs> yeah. Save the dog, right? Save the Kill dog. Kill the dog, save the cat. Yeah. yeah. So one of the last <laughs> things on our notes from when we met before this, um, we wanted to kind of talk about one of those things of 
maybe you don't think of this before you're looking for an editor, you've done a lot of the other things, but I have three points that I want to tell everyone, and please pass this along to your writer friends. When you are getting ready to give a manuscript to someone else, I don't care if it's an editor or your friend, uh, make sure the formatting is correct because that is pleasing to the eye and easy for people to read. And if you give it to an editor and they have to spend time fixing that, it eats into their editing time. I would say absolutely run a spell check because it's free, it's already in Word, just do it. Uh, the second is it needs to be in Times New Roman, 12 point double spaced. Anything else, it's, it's not wrong, it's just, it's easy to read. That font for a reason is used in so many uh, publishing things, that's why they pick it. And the last is please save it as a doc or docx file. Uh, no PDFs, no Google Docs, and if you're using Mac pages, you're going to need to convert it before you send it to us because then when we go to convert it, it gets really messy. Yeah. And the last thing, when you're paying someone to work on it, or again, if you've asked them for help and you send them a, a document they can't read, you're already a step behind. So word is the word. Yes. Um, do do your stuff in Word. That's what that's what most when most submissions want either a doc or a PDF. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them only take docs, and and so work in Word. It's it's easy to work in if you've got one of those Scriveners or something. You can convert it. Um, Google Docs is is a pain because Google Docs are are living documents, right? Mm -hmm. So if you send somebody a Google Doc, you could mess with it. They could mess with it, so on and so forth. Hard copy of Word that, that, that an editor can print out or, or work with on the review uh, tab and that sort of thing. But uh, exactly as, as Julie said, I think Word is the, is the way to go to write it. And if you have Mac pages, I think Mac actually has a Word in Word. You can export program. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you can export, export Word now. Yeah, yeah because I've Google. had people yeah. like, say, well, I'm just not going to change it. If you're not going to do it in pages, then I'm not going to. And I say, OK. <laughs> <laughs> you can find the editors that work in Mac pages, and that's fine. I'm not one of them. I just know that for a lot of the programs we use, like Perfected, and because Word is the standard for the publishing industry, you're going to need to eventually Eventually, use yeah. It. You eventually, you're going to be in Word. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then you can oh, buy you that for your Mac. Mac. You yeah. can buy Word for you your Mac. something different from what I do is I use the Mac pages and then I convert it mm -hmm. to Word doc right. yeah. before I send it to yeah. someone. That's yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. Buy a new no, 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 no. That's why I said they actually have apps and they actually have Word for Mac. So no, yeah. you don't have to buy a new computer. As long as the track changes are showing up when you open that back yeah. up in your Mac pages, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. And a Kindle only takes Word in it too. So if you're going to upload to a, a self publisher, mm -hmm. okay, you're going to need Word, which you said if you convert it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It but even during markets. conversion, you need to look at stuff yeah. real closely. Because that's where you can get some issues with your formatting again. Yeah. You can get hanging words, which uh, in the industry are called widows and orphans. Right. So when you turn a page and there's a word at the top or a word at the bottom, you don't want those. That's what a designer is going to fix for you. And that's what a proofread is for, too. Because yeah. I'm looking for those random words that just aren't on the right line. Do we have more questions, Paige? Yeah, we got two more. Okay. So Mike has already kind of answered this, Trish, a little bit. Some of you will work with a manuscript in progress. Do any of you only take completed manuscripts? Can you speak to that? So my experience um, has been when I have worked with someone who we are just going, say, like 40 pages at a time. By the time I get to those last 40 pages, I might have already corrected something in the first 40 that now we're both doing double work to fix. Mm -hmm. It can really depend on the kind of book, the genre, what you're going for. For someone writing like a nonfiction, like the medical uh, reproductive history book and the real estate book, that was fine because nothing's going to change. It, I'm reading a nonfiction book right now. Those chapters are pretty much going to stay the same. So they're not dependent on the chapter that happened before them. 
I have found, and my former business partner found that with fiction, it didn't work for us because it ended up being double work for everybody. So, so I charge for the double work. I mean, you know, that's the, and, and it happens. Yeah, so if you're if you're doing if if we get to chapter four and we realize that we need to change something in chapter one, we're going to do it right, and then we'll go back and we'll review chapter one. I don't do a lot of copy editing other than saying, uh, here's how you use lay and lie. Here's how we're whom and who go, right? And so once we know that, we don't have to correct it again later on. So there is some, some education that happens um, so, that, so that when the, the, uh, the writer themselves is, is fixing chapter one, we don't have to go back and do copy edit on that again, right? But it's, if you're working with something that's being written, it absolutely is going to change. It absolutely chapter one is going to change. I know that you have to get to the end, then you're going to go back and chapter one is going to change. So, so we push through, um, and then the author will say, Oh, this has to happen in this chapter. Now I have to go back and change the name, or this person has to be born, or whatever it is, right? <laughs> you know, <Born>. yeah, so <laughs> so that's okay. And I know that 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 process is going to take me a lot longer, but the truth. Um, it is that when I work with people like that, um, they're doing it primarily for accountability. I'm going to give you X number of pages this week. Yeah. Right. And it, and it helps them get it done. So to me, I'm okay with that. That's coaching to me. That's more, right. more so than, than, than editing. And that's how I feel about it, too. Yeah. I'm willing to work with anyone who wants to listen to what I have to say, yeah. if I can help them. Um, but I wouldn't start by, okay, write this chapter and then I'll look at it. I would help them in the developmental stage first so that they had an idea of what is going to happen in all the major points that need to be considered to the end. So you, you know the beginning, you know the inciting incident, you know what happens in the midpoint or about what happens because everything because changes. Because it's going to change, right? It all changes, but at least you have somewhere to go. And that doesn't mean, and so that means I can help you in all those stages if that's how you want to do it. I don't have to have a complete manuscript. Manuscript, but we do have to talk about the developmental part of the story, the plot, and how the characters are going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have an upcoming project that is somebody taking their blog posts after some stuff that happened, and we're going to turn it into a book. But again, those are pretty chronological. So she's filling in 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 between the blog posts, but that's not going to change from you know one chapter to another really. So we are going to end up doing that one kind of incrementally. And that's going to be a memoir. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah, she uh, right before the pandemic, she broke both of her arms, oh, wow. and so oh. she like so her blog is called T Rex Arms. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Very excited for this. So <laughs> she's got funny. yeah. So then and it's hilarious. And so yeah, we're gonna go kind of more piecemeal, but I do it very rarely. I would say. All right. Do you have book recommendations or resources for people to how they can self-educate on marketing? Oh, gosh. Um, Join us in June. <laughs> um, well, so, let, me, let me just, uh, uh, as, I, as I said, and, I, and I'll, I'll let you talk, but you know, Central Oregon Writers Guild has, Julie is going to be here in June doing a workshop. A social media workshop. Like three hours. Um, Leva is going to be here in November doing a book marketing workshop, right? So those are well, they're not free. They're really cheap, right? If you're a member, it's ten bucks, and, and it's, so uh, that's that's pretty cheap. So sorry to interrupt you, Julie. Go ahead and answer that. Question. Um, honestly, there's not a book that I can think of. What I will say is one of the people who has like revolutionized book marketing, especially self-published, is Hugh Howey, who wrote Howl and Wool. He has a blog still, I believe, and he does a lot of like, he would be what you would consider kind of that like guerrilla marketing of selling his own book. He's never been traditionally published. He like breaks the mold on Amazon. But there's no one way there's no one book on how to be a writer either. I have 15 different ones at my house 
I don't own a single one of these. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> this is so good. I have, <laughs> I have no plot, no problem, which is the guy who started National Novel Writing Month, also right. known as NaNoWriMo. Yeah. I have um, all like the Stephen King on writing. I have Ian Patchett's on writing. Anyway, we all have. Oh, yeah, we so all have this. So lots there's, of, lots yeah, of there's not writing. a book. I would say, I mean, Google is your best friend on how to market your book. The problem is, is that there's 500 ways. Right. So do you want to be on social media or do you want to be face-to-face? -face? Do you, I mean, you have to kind of find your own marketing, I guess. Do you yeah. want to do a podcast? Do you want to do it on Pinterest? Yeah. All, there are you, a very number of I thought maybe another question. One, oh. The marketing yeah. changes because that algorithms change. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Amazon just changed theirs this year. And it's not the amount of reviews they're looking at the amount of people actually reading your material mm -hmm. it's just like if you have an a book on unlimited they know how many words are read yep. and they uh drive the people to that yeah thank you guys yeah. good to see thank you, you. Thank you. so there's a um um so if, if you go to our uh website the main page that lists all the events and everything if you go down 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 you'll see the recordings of previous uh, of previous uh, meetings and the february february last year february 2021 was david crow and he did one called how to sell 100,000 copies of your book so you could watch that that was very good he basically hit the bricks i mean he, he did it all by hand, so um, yeah. it's worth the watch. Yeah, you can also hire people to do your marketing. I do some marketing publicity for people depending on what they really want to do. You know, sending out to people that do blog posts or you know have review blogs. Um, but it's it's a lot of time for sometimes not a lot of return on investment. So yeah, you got to be a marketer too. Yeah, it's your baby. You have to sell it to everyone. But you got to write it first. Yep. Last question. What do you think of the program Grammarly? Thumbs down from a panelist. All right, um, Julie, what do you think? Why is that? It depends on who you write this. Yeah. Grammarly, in my opinion, if you're writing a blog post or a newsletter, an email, is probably fine because it's going to catch your main spelling and grammar errors it's going to understand that a comma needs to be there just like word would it is absolutely not going to find the emotion no the feeling if you want to use it as a, an additional spell checker fine but it is not an editor it is a computer algorithm program just like word is and it doesn't know what it's doing i get um i teach comp at cocc and osu and i get papers and i mark them up and I sit down with the students and I say, you know, you need this here or this grammar uh, issue is here and there. And they're like, I ran it through Grammarly. <laughs> and so you got to kind of, I think it helps to know the stuff too, right? Commas in some cases are optional. So it depends. And this standing up in your living room, reading your work out loud, you'll know where a comma goes, right? You'll know how stupid that sentence sounds or that you should switch it around or whatever. Grammarly won't tell you that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it is, it's just a computer program. It doesn't have a soul, so right. it can't find the soul in your work. Okay. Yeah. We all have such great soul. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> We're going to say good night to everyone on Zoom. Okay. Um, you on Zoom are missing out on this great spread that Amanda brought. So we've got <laughs> snacks and cookies and coffee and Cheese all kinds of cool meat. stuff that we're going to eat. And um, obviously, feel free to email any yeah. of us with additional yeah. questions. All of our Absolutely. stuff is on the Writers Guild website. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and if you're feeling up to it, we'll be live again here in February. So uh, awesome. if you if you feel like coming right. out to the world, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.